paradigm shift in paradigm change in medicine and medical education. So, so uh, let's welcome everybody. It's nice. It's it's great to be here again. Uh, I want to thank. Uh, Egon, Christiane, and the entire College of Medicine team. I mean, what, what you all are doing here is very exciting, and I, I enjoy my visits to Qatar. This is actually, um, I actually live in Baltimore, Maryland, United States. Uh, this is the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. This is the original, on the left here, this is the original hospital and medical school that opened in 1893, and is still there. Um, and this is our new hospital that opened in 2012, and actually the, the old hospital is right behind this building. That's why you can't see it. Um, so if you ever visit, it's a wonderful place to work. What I'm going to talk to you about is um, paradigm change in medicine, because I think the way we are practicing medicine, the way that we are becoming patients of medicine, and therefore the way we educate future physicians and scientists is changing. We're in the midst of a, a radical change that I think if, if we don't anticipate it, we all, uh, we're going to be behind it. So I'm going to define paradigm change. Um, and I'm going to talk about what I mean, and I'm just showing two old paradigms where we used to, physicians used to, to just exsanguinate our patients till near death. And here's a time in the United States when physicians actually uh, advertised for cigarettes. I mean, that was just crazy. Thankfully, we've gone beyond those paradigms. Uh, what I'm going to do is, this is going to be fun and interesting, hopefully. It's, it'll be fun for me, hopefully it's fun for you. Because um, I'm actually going to put some historical context into medicine and medical education, working myself up to uh, where we are now. So there's a uh, history here. But I am not a true historian. I love history. I read a lot about history. Um, but I'm not a, a classically trained historian. And I will admit this is a Western-centric view of medical history. Um, a lot of amazing things have happened in this part of the world, um, although unfortunately a lot of them kind of were, um, were lost to the literature. Um, in, in kind of the 17, 1800s, 1800s um, and, and should be rediscovered. And one day I'll, I'll redo this entire, um, I make some references here, but I'll, one day I'll, I'll redo this entire history with more inclusion of what was happening in the uh, Ottoman Empire, et cetera, et cetera. So the founding physician of Johns Hopkins is uh, William Osler. He's arguably the uh, most famous Western physician uh, to this date, his name is, is associated with being a good doctor. This is him at Johns Hopkins writing the first uh, comprehensive textbook uh, of internal medicine, Principles and Practices. And what he said in 1895, I'm going to quote William Oster a few times, and, and he was an incredibly bright guy. He said a lot of things that were right even 125 years later. So he says, like a living organism, truth grows and its gradual evolution may be traced from the tiny germ to the mature product. Much of history is a record of the mishaps of truth that have struggled to the birth only to die or decay. Or the germ of truth may be dormant for centuries awaiting the fullness of time. And my point is that one of the germs of truth is now germinating in our lifetimes and we as patients and physicians need to uh, deal with that. Um, so I'll start with what is a paradigm. Paradigm is a word that is used a lot Originally, it uh, derives, and it was used a lot in science, it actually has been co-opted and appropriated by the management people and the bankers and all those kind of things. And I, I believe that they don't use it properly. Um, but the original scientific interpretation of the word paradigm dates from this book, which was written in 1962 by Thomas Kuhn, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he decided, and he, Kuhn, defined in 1962 a paradigm within the scientific context as a set of beliefs or a way of believing things that is sufficiently unprecedented to attract an enduring group. It's what people believe at the time, a way of approaching science at the moment, okay? But it's not, he acknowledged that it's not the final answer, okay? It's not, um, it's not the, the absolute final answer. And what Kuhn talks a lot about is that truth is a perception of what you know at that moment. And truth changes over time as you get more information and data. Truth is not static. Truth is dynamic and is, is subject to the interpretation of the people who are looking at it. So he said that you know, a paradigm is sufficiently open-ended to, uh, to leave unresolved questions for investigation. And that's kind of what scientific research is. So what he said is that scientific progress occurs via paradigm shifts or seismic shifts. 
and that what happens is we have one set of beliefs of how we understand chemistry or physics or medicine, and we do research. And we find little things in there that we kind of understand things better, but then we find out that there are inconsistencies within what we believe, things that just don't fit exactly. And it's these inconsistencies that take us to the next great understanding. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about, I'm gonna give you some details on that. And he defined a term called normal science. Normal science is the research that takes place within the current paradigm. And what happens is as you just start accumulating more information, and it turns out often precipitated by a technological advance, you start understanding that what you thought was true is not true, and you have a paradigm shift. That's kind of the way science progress. And a new paradigm, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the old and the new paradigms, must seem better than the competitors, but it need not be the final truth, because we really never get to the final truth, probably. We just keep incrementally moving along and understanding things a little better. And so what, what, why Kuhn's book is so famous is the shifts is that it, science does not progress in a linear fashion. Science progresses as a linear fashion for some number of years, then all of a sudden has a radical change, what he calls a paradigm shift, and we believe things that are totally, or we understand things that are totally different, okay? And why was this an important, um, important uh, observation? Well, it turns out that nobody likes to admit that they're wrong. Okay? And nobody likes to believe that what they believed was wrong. And, and so what he points out is that typically textbooks and literature and traditional education blurs all the mistakes that we used to make and we kind of make it seem like a continuous hierarchy. Oh, we kept learning from things, we learned this, we learned that, we learned that, we learned that. Um, and that's why um, he thinks that um, the perception prior to 1962 was that uh, science is cumulative, but he said, no, it's not cumulative, it's, it's, it's punctuated by these shifts. Okay, so what I'd like to do very quickly, and just for fun, and because and, uh, I do love history, is take you back through the prior paradigm shifts and get to the one that I think we're at now. And I'll try not to bore you. So, Medicine and medical education circa 500 before the birth of Christ, okay, was controlled purely by deities, okay, by your religion, okay? Religion was the final arbiter of health and disease. And essentially the model for health and diseases right here is that if you develop symptoms, it's because the gods were imposing some set of circumstances upon you and you would therefore appeal to the gods or to magic, depending on what culture you're in, to either make you better or to not make you better. And how you did was simply based on the balance of whether the gods wanted you to get better or not, okay? Um, and therefore, it was obvious that the religious figures dispensed all health. Um, and therefore, since you were trying to appeal to the gods, that's why there were a lot of shrines that were built to appeal to the gods, and people made sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and that, out of that came the Greek and Roman tradition of gods of health. This is the Greek god of health, Asclepius. The reason I put him up here is because he, this is the derivation of why physicians, the mark of the physician is the staff with the single snake. It's not the double snake, it's the single snake. And he was the son of Apollo, and he was the god of medicine and healing. And the first healing cult was created in his name. So the uh, priests in Greece uh, who were healers were uh, of the cult of Asclepius. Uh, interesting, he had a daughter whose name was Hygieia, who became the mother of hygiene or cleanliness. Um, and that's where that word comes from. And interestingly, Asclepius was killed by Zeus in, in mythology. Theoretically, because Zeus accused him of raising the dead. Other people interpreted that actually he actually knew something about healing people and he actually made some of them better, but that angered Zeus who was kind of trying to control all things. But if you believe that, then this is the, the sanctuary of Asclepius at Coast Greece. And technically, this is like the first tertiary hospital. Pardon me. This is, like the first, this is where people would come for complex medical illnesses and they would see the, the, the priests of Asclepius in coasts, and this is where they would theater, theoretically get healed or not healed. But this is like you know, the first referral center, as far as I could tell. So what happened? Well, in ancient Greece was the birth of the scientific method, um, initiated by Socrates, Pythagoras, Plato, uh, those remarkably, incredibly brilliant guy. And they, they, and they developed the scientific method. 
they, this is the birth of observation, reason, experimentation even, uh, was, was born in ancient Greece in 600 BC. And what was one of the, and remember everything I, I'm gonna talk about, a lot of particularly medicine and science revolves around technology. They had very little technology there except for their eyes and their minds. So what did they see and what did they observe and what did they reason? So they're moving away from the gods and they're trying to impose order on the universe. What do they notice? They notice that liquid is the source of all life. That in the spring, rains would come and plants would come back to life. Um, if you drained a plant of its sap, the plant would die. Similarly, if you drained a human of its sap or blood, the human would die. So based on all that they could observe at that time, if you did not ingest enough water, you would uh, die also. So that you had to ingest water, therefore liquid was the source of life. And that's a very, very rational observation, frankly. It's still true. And out of that came Hippocrates, who kind of codified the, uh, he is a contemporary of Aristotle and Plato, those guys. And he actually is the first person to codify a medical corpus. Um, he lived 460 to 370 BC. He, uh, his name is associated with the Hippocratic Corpus, which essentially is all the medical knowledge of the time. And it's 70 medical works written by him and or his students. He was also the first great graduate student advisor in that he had a lot of graduate students working for him. They wrote a lot of things and he took credit for it. Um, so he's kind of the classic uh, great PhD mentor. He induced the first paradigm shift in medicine in that he's gonna move things away from the gods into a scientific method of taking care of patients. And this paradigm is gonna last 1,500 years. So this one did pretty well. And this is the classic Hippocratic humoral theory where we as humans are comprised of four humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And these things, this is part of the dichotomy, the wet, cold, hot, dry dichotomy that was prevalent in the day. It all derives from the same stuff. It's the four seasons, it's the four personalities, the phlegmatic personality, the sanguine personality, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also the four elements, which many of you have heard of, air, wire, fire, water, and earth. So out of this, Hippocrates, and this general understanding of science and, and nature, which was proposed originally by Aristotle, Hippocrates modified and embraced into medicine and healthcare. So if it was true for the entire world, it had to be true for us humans. So here's what Hippocrates wrote. He said the human body contains blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Those are those four humors I just mentioned. They're the things that make up the constitution and cause pains and health. Health is primarily a state in which these constituent substances are in correct proportion to each other, both in strength, quantity, and are well mixed. So that you as a human would be healthy if your four humors were equally in proportion and were well mixed, okay? Therefore, the physician, these are all, these are all everything in, uh, in uh, italics here is all uh, from the Hippocratic corpus. To put it briefly, the physician should treat disease by the principle of the opposition to the cause of the disease according to its form. This will bring the patient the most relief and seems to be the principle of healing. Therefore, so if you had one humor in excess, lower it. If you had one humor in deficiency, raise it. So that's why we had bloodletting. Bloodletting was trying to get rid of some of your humors. Cupping, a very frequent Asian and, um, and uh, Mediterranean uh, technique purging, enemas, et cetera, et cetera. It was all meant to restore the balance of your fluids. Um, and interestingly, um, in Asia, there's a lot of parallelity to this, these kinds of things, that the whole yin-yang thing, it's not for humans, but the whole balance, uh, the Chinese medicine, it turns out, is also based on the observation of balance, too. They didn't have four humors, they kind of have two humors with a lot of things, but it's, it's not dissimilar, it turns out. But here's what's interesting. Hippocrates was a great observer. Hippocrates discerned genetics. Again, his writing, a phlegmatic child is born, remember phlegmatic is a personality type. Phlegmatic child is born of a phlegmatic parent, a bilious child of a bilious parent. So he understood heredity at that level simply by observing it, although he did not have the scientific basis to understand heredity, obviously. He also, they also explained widespread disease that we would expel humors and you would ingest the bad humors that I'm ingesting and throw your body off balance. And that's how they explained 
um, like epidemics or you know, kind of uh, infectious diseases or uh, transmissible diseases through the air. They knew that things were transmitted through the air. And they figured out that it was because it would alter your body's humors because these were evil humors that you could not see. So you treated those by decreasing fluid or, uh, or fluid intake. There's an old adage in the United States that I always get wrong. It's either starve a cold and feed a fever or feed a cold and starve a fever. Has anyone ever heard of that? No? Uh, it's feed a cold and starve a fever? I'm sure this is where it comes from. I always get it wrong. I don't believe in either of them, but um, <laughs> I just I feed everything personally. I feed a cold and feed a fever. Um, but I'm sure that's where it came from. I'm sure that's where that edge came from. So Galen is the guy who kind of takes um, Hippocrates' paradigm and really solidifies it. He was a Roman. He lived 131 to 201 AD. He was a great physician, a really, really skilled observer. And again, remember, they're, they're scientists. They're, all they have is observation. So he understood that function, that he believed that function was determined by God. And that's why I think Galen's theories, so obviously Galen predates both Christianity and uh, Islam. But the fact that he referred everything to causality of God is probably one of the reasons why this paradigm stayed for the, the, the next 1, 000, 1,500 years or so, um, because it appealed to the churches. So Galen advanced anatomy dramatically. He did animal dissections. He did not do human dissections. He did animal dissections, but he did extensive and detailed animal dissections. And he discerned bone and muscle structure. He figured out that the kidneys, not the, um, not the, ur uh, not the bladder, produce urine. Remember, initially, you'd think, you know that your urine comes from your bladder. That's where your urine is. It would be obvious to you, unless you've done a real good dissection to find the ureters, that urine just comes from the bladder. But Galen said, no, it comes from the kidneys, and the bladder is just a holding tank. Galen did a lot of work on neural anatomy. He defined seven out of the 12 cranial nerves. He found the meninges. He actually figured out injury and contralaterality. That is, that if you have an injury or a stroke on one side of your brain, it affects the opposite side of your body. He figured that out in 131 AD, um, strictly by good observation. He figured out that the spinal cords injuries and spinal cords cause paralysis. He figured out that there are separate arteries and veins. He figured that out. Um, now, interesting, he could not see the capillaries, the connections. This is, going to be very, this is going to come up later. He could not see the connections between them. Why? There was no such thing as microscopy, right? All he had, you can see arteries and you can see veins grossly. They're easy. So, so he observed these and he came up with a physiology. So he came up with this Galenic physiology that is going to stay intact until the year 1500 or so, 1600. And it, if you think about it, that if we didn't have microscopes, you have a really hard time disputing this physiology. It makes complete sense. So he knew that the brain was the seat of the soul's rational facilities. He knew that if you had bad brain injury, your body could stay alive, but you couldn't think, you couldn't interact. You didn't have a soul, as he would say and it controlled your sensation and motor functions. He got that exactly right. Your heart is the seat of your passions. That's why we still consider the heart the seat of the passions, because it's the source of the arteries. The arteries come from the heart, and they pump life spirit to the body. And the lungs are there simply as a radiator to kind of cool the vital spirits, OK? That's the only reason you have lungs, is to cool your vital spirits. But we send out arteries from the heart that, send out, that give our body life and, and, uh, and, and kind of our vital spirit. He knew that when the food we eat gets digested in the gut, it, the nutrients go to the liver. He knew that, which is exactly right, by the way. And then, but then he hypothesized that the liver send it, sent out veins that provided you nourishment to your body. Okay? And so we had a brain, we had arteries that went out to the body and sent out uh, blood that contained vital spirit, and we had veins that sent out nutrition. And again, I challenge you to dispute or to, to wreck this hypothesis without, without really knowing about microscopy. It's tough to argue with that one, okay? Until 1628, of course, okay? So that's the humor theory and the whole Galactic, and Galen believed in the four humors. He, he incorporated all the four humors into his physiology. And that's the way we practice medicine. That's the way patients received care. That's the way we educated doctors for many, many years. Um, it persisted for many years, and that's why, you know, we, and they figured out drugs 
worked, they figured out drugs. They, they discovered a lot of drugs in this period of time. And they figured out, and the, the hypothesis for how drugs worked is that it changed, the drugs had the capacity to change one human into the other. So it could change your blood into black bile if that's what you did, if it benefited. And that's, and that's alchemy, where, you, where substances can actually change form. Um, and that's why people tried to make gold out of various minerals, the same thing. So that's how drugs worked. And they knew that drugs did work. Um, but it did it by altering and restoring balance to humors. They figured out surgery. They discovered cautery at that time, that you could stop bleeding by tying off the arteries and it would save people's lives. Um, and they explained, as I said, the, the massive plagues by evil spirits. There was little scientific progress in this time, and, and, and you could say that many people ascribe it to the fact that, that it was not, that the church embraced this, particularly in Europe, the church embraced this theory avidly, and the church did not, at that time, did not really um, enjoy dissent very well. Um, but then came 1550 to 1650, and the, phys and the anatomy physiology paradigm, the, the humoral theory is going to fall apart and after lasting a good time. And many people contributed to that, but I'm going to describe two famous individuals, Vesalius and William Harvis, Harvey, for overthrowing the, uh, the humoral paradigm. So Vesalius was first. He was lived about 50, 100 years before uh, Harvey. And he was the world's greatest anatomist. He took Galanic anatomy up a notch. Why? Because he actually dissected humans. He's one of the first to really document extensively dissecting humans. Um, he spent long, he grew up in Paris, and then he moved to uh, Padua, Italy at the age of 23, where he became a full professor at the age of 23, which is pretty impressive. And you know, my, my kids are still in diapers at 23. Um, his seminal work is called the Fabrica, and at some point, I'm hoping that, I, don't, I suspect Qatar University, maybe they have a first edition of that. Um, if they don't, they, at some point now that they have a college of medicine, that should be one of their acquisitions. There are many available, they're not, and I can tell you a funny story later about how, quote, they're not that expensive. Um, I can't buy one, but <laughs> maybe the university can. Um, but it has 200 illustrations, and it gets anatomy almost exactly right. And all of the mistakes that Galen made because he dissected animals and not humans, um, uh, Vesalius got right, and he really elevated examination of the human form to a new form. And it's, it's a work of art. These are two drawings from, um, from the Fabrica, which is one of the most beautiful books if you've ever had a chance to see one. Um, and for any of you who come to visit Hopkins, I'd love to show you the one that we have at Hopkins. Um, but it turns out, for those of you who are Renaissance art um, aficionados, it's thought that the, um, the, um, the um, gallery of Titian was actually the illustrators of these drawings. And that's why there's, and there's many that are just beautiful poses. It's, it's an amazing work of art. But more importantly, from an anatomic uh, sense, from teaching anatomy to medical students and physicians, it's almost exactly correct. It's beautiful. But William Harvey is the one who really overthrew the humoral theory. He's another, he also went to Padua, uh, left England. Um, and look who was at Padua when he was there. I mean, this was a very fertile place to study. Fabricus, Galileo, we've all heard of, Descartes, Bacon, Boyle. It was a very f kind of, it was the center of kind of intellectual thought of, uh, of in, in the 16th century. Um, he joined the College of Physicians in the 1600, and his seminal work is written in 1628. Um, and it defines the circulation. Because remember, Galen said that there were parallel arteries and veins that went out together. So Harvey is the one who's going to figure out that they're actually connected. And I'm going to show you how he did that in one second. And that's going to overthrow the humoral theory. That, observ that simple observation that there's a circulation is going to destroy Galanic physiology and, and kind of allow us to move into kind of modern physiology. And I'll show you how he did it. Um, it's an obvious experiment, but it's interesting. Now, it turns out that the great um, Egyptian physician, Arab physician, Ibn al-Nafis, 400 years earlier, actually was questioning actively Galen's um, physiology. He didn't come to the right answer, but he, he kind of, he figured out the holes, as it were, in Galen's thought, and it was, it, had he been left to work a little bit more, uh, he probably would have come to the right answer. He was the start of getting, of understanding it. But then there's this Spanish guy, Cervatus, who I've, I've read a lot about, who's always, the, I think he's probably the smartest person who ever lived. Um, he actually, um, he actually wrote a book 50, 60 years before um, uh, Harvey 
that gets it exactly right. He describes the pulmonary circulation. He describes the systemic circulation. He wrote it in a book, but unfortunately he wrote it in a book that also questioned the Holy Trinity um, and, and kind of decried the Holy Trinity. And that got the church, actually both churches at the time, the Catholic Church and the, Pro the new Protestant Church, got everybody mad at him in that part of the world, and they wound up burning him at the stake um, with all copies of his book, except for I think there's 12 copies of this book existing. So nobody read the book <laughs> that had really described the circulation to a T. Um, and that book actually turns out to be the most rare book, in the, considered the rarest book in the world. But Servetus got it right, but nobody read what he wrote. So here's what Harvey wrote. This is the only illustration in De Motu Cordis, but it definitively proves the circulation. And all he did was he spent time examining the veins, the blood flow in veins, and realized, that, you know, Galen thought the blood flow in arteries and veins went from, from central to peripheral. Harvey demonstrated just by putting his fingers on, and on, on your veins that blood in the veins flows from peripheral back into the center. And from that and other work that had gone on, he deduced that actually there's a circulation. And this is what he wrote. These are Harvey's words. My conclusion was so novel and unheard of character that I fear injury to myself from the envy of a few, but I tremble lest I have mankind at large from my enemies. Listen, all he's describing is the circulation, and he thinks they're going to kill him. You know, just by, if he got it wrong. I mean, these are high stakes. I mean, we don't, if, I, if we publish something that turns out to be wrong, nobody kills us anymore. Maybe we should go back to that. Egon thinks we should go back to that. Um, <laughs> there'll be less publications and more truth. Um, and essentially, these are Harvey's words. He says, I began to wonder if I had a movement as if it was in a circle, the blood. The hypothesis I subsequently verified, I saw that the blood forced by the action of the left ventricle into the arteries was distributed to all parts of the body, finding further that the blood flows back through the veins, right up to the right auricle, which we, a, a motion we may call circulate. He figured all that out just by pressing on arteries. Remember, they still don't have microscopes at this point. So he refuted Galenic theory. He actually did some calculations based on this and figured out that if Galen had been correct, the liver would have to produce three times the body weight in blood per hour, because he actually quantified blood flow to some extent how much was going on, and he said, well, there's no way that can happen. He figured out that the, the heart is a four-chambered pump. He described systole and diastole, and he is, he said there was tension to the, and if you consider this a medical curriculum paradigm, the machine model, there was tension to it. There was, there was, there was discoveries, there were innovations, there were things happening. Um, you had to incorporate new biomedical knowledge, we had to incorporate new patient diseases and demographics, all this kind of stuff. We improved our communication skills of our doctors in this time. Um, we also made many curricular changes that brought in modular curriculums and new pedagogies and all this kind of stuff. But none of this really changed the machine model. We still had this dichotomy between normal and abnormal. Um, and, and many places still do, and, and I think it's unfortunate. Um, I don't think that's a paradigm change. This is a classic husband and wife speaking. And I'm not sure who's talking here, by the way. He says, look, I, prom I can't promise I'll change, but I can promise I'll pretend to change. Um, that's the secret to many marriages. <laughs> Whatever. So here's a case. Um, I think I have time. Do I, is it okay to present a case? Do I have enough time? You know? Okay. Yeah. So this is actually one of my daughters. Honest to God, this is, true. this is a true story. Um, this is one of my daughters. A couple years ago. She was 24, and um, after complaining to her, and I, I shall say that both of her parents are physicians, she complained to both of her physicians for a number of days that she didn't feel well, she had a fever, and we were kind of telling her, she's also an athlete, we're saying, oh, you have a muscle pull, we're, we're, we never treat your children. Um, so finally, we take her to the hospital, and it turns out that she has fever, she has pain in her side, she has difficult, uh, pain with urination, and she hadn't eaten, which is unusual for that daughter. Uh, her blood pressure is low, her heart rate is fast, she has a pretty high temperature, but she's alert and but she's uncomfortable. Um, her blood and her urine cultures grow an E. coli, which is a, a, a bacteria, okay? So she has a urinary tract infectious with what we would call sepsis. So 12 hours later, what happens in the next 12 hours? This is the messy scenario. Man, Lionel messy, not, uh, not Indians as wide. And after fluids and antibiotics, her blood pressure and her heart rate are normal, she gets better, and she gets uh, two weeks of antibiotics and she gets better, okay?
But there's another scenario that could have taken place, which is the, I don't like arsenal. Um, despite fluid and, uh, and their, their sponsors also amorites, by the way. Um, despite fluids and antibiotics, the blood pressure falls and she requires artificial phases of pressors. She develops multi-organ failure. I'm a critical care physician. This is a scenario I see not uncommonly. And she's comatose. And this is actually a patient that I had in the ICU a number of years ago who had the exact same scenario as my daughter, who grew E. coli from um, her urine and from her blood. This patient did not survive. This patient has gangrene, as you can see. This patient has all kinds of things going on in their chest x-ray. Exact same scenario, this patient was older. This patient was in her 40s, but she was not that old, okay? Why the difference? So this is a figure I took from up to date that talks about sepsis, this phenomenon called sepsis. And it says that, yeah, some people get better and some people get worse, and we don't know why. They make, you know, we don't know why. And, and, and it's a totally inadequate explanation, is what I'm trying to say here. So now we know that there's differences between my daughter, intrinsic differences to my daughter, between my daughter and the other patient who passed away. And we also know that it's important differences between the E. coli that presumably affected my daughter and the E. coli that affected this other patient that determine, and it's this interaction between the two that determines whether or not you live and do well, or you don't do well. Um, and this is the key, this is one of the keys to the next paradigm shift. So this is the former head of the history of medicine at Johns Hopkins, Oswe Temkin. Um, he wrote, there's no science of the individual and modern medicine, which you know, he wrote this in the 60s, suffers from a fundamental contradiction. The practice deals with individuals. We see one patient at a time but the theory grasps universals only. And, and I refer you back to this figure, which does not have any specificity to any patient at all within it. And this is not a new theory either. Smart people have figured this out in, this is written in, um, in 1902 by Archibald Barad in England. He understood that the individuality is an important characteristic of understanding patients and their diseases. So what happened? Why do we suddenly have, and, and what I'm going to say is that the new paradigm is the paradigm of individuality. What happened? Well, this happened. This happened in 2003, that we elucidated the reference genome. We didn't get the whole genome, we got a reference genome. So this is 2003, and four years later, science declares that the breakthrough of the year is understanding or acknowledging, because I don't, we don't still understand it, human genetic variation. So, this is a great man who taught me a lot about this, a man named Bart Child who passed away at the age of 93. And he summed it up. He said, diseases are caused by independent actions of neither genes nor experiences, but by the influence on, of each on your protein products. And they, the interaction between these two is what determines health and disease. This is the new paradigm. This is the way we're gonna practice medicine. This is the way you as patients are gonna get treated. And this is how we need to educate doctors and scientists coming forward. And this is how Bart Childs explained it to me. So this is a figure that every medical school in the world shows. And what it is is a measure, a, a graph, and just look at any one of these graphs, doesn't matter which one. Oh, here. This is age on the x-axis as a function of bone mineral density. And what this is taught in every medical school in the world is that bone mineral density in women, this is all women, declines with age. We, everybody learns that, okay? And what Barton said is that's patently false. That is not a true statement. That these curves that show a decline in age, this is what medical schools typically would teach, and students would memorize this, these curves. That's not the message. The message are the error bars. These error bars are enormous. So what is the reinterpretation of this graph? It's that some women, as they age, have a dramatic and notable and important loss in bone mineral density. And some other women, as they age, have a trivial or minor loss in bone mineral density. That's the important message. That yeah, it's not saying that osteoporosis is not an important disease. It's saying that just because a woman is sitting in front of you at the age of 50, does not necessarily mean that by the age of 70, she's going to have dramatically 
less bone mineral density. She might, or she might not. And it turns out that whether she does or not is a, is a, is a function of her intrinsic composition, which are partly her genes, and the environment in which she lives. Does she get sunlight? Does she get, have enough ingestion of vitamin D, et cetera, et cetera? That's the way we need to educate physicians and take care of patients. It's in that context. So out of that came the individuality model of medical education. And this is what we, how we, we redesigned the Johns Hopkins curriculum around this, and I'll show you a schematic of it in a second. How do we define disease? We don't define disease as an alteration of humors. We don't define disease that everybody gets sick all the time. It's an alteration in your individual homeostasis. Why do humans get disease? They get disease because of a combination of what their intrinsic makeup is and external factors. Now it is true that if all of us, despite our genetics, get hit by a car, it's gonna do damage, okay? But on the other hand, if all of us breathe in the MERS or the influenza virus, only for, for influenza, we know, only about 30% of us are gonna get sick. So that's the way we think about health and disease. It's a combination of who you are and what you're exposed to. Um, why do some people have disease? Well, importantly, why do many people not get disease? Turns out, we don't, it's, a, it's a dirty little secret, we don't tell the medical students. It turns out that only 20 or 35, 20 to 25% of smokers get lung disease. The other 75 don't, okay? And we're only starting to figure out why we do it. Now, I'm not advocating cigarette smoking, because it is bad for your heart and it causes all kinds of other diseases, okay? But it turns out that if you look at just a chronic lung disease, only about 25% of smokers get it, okay? Uh, why does this person have disease now? Why didn't they manifest their disease yesterday? What can we do to restore this individual person to their unique steady state? And how can we utilize our knowledge of this individual and the environment to prevent disease and maintain health? That's the paradigm that I'm advocating for medicine now. And this is a, a paper we wrote about it. Uh, we call our the curriculum we designed at Johns Hopkins based on this paradigm, uh, genes to society. And this is what it looks like. So the classic medical curriculum had, was based around a classic case, um, which most clinicians know the classic case of anything never exists, and was very much kind of typological. What we say, and this is how we teach our students now at, at Hopkins, from the day they get there, we say that every single one of us in this room lives on a continuum between latent disease or risk of disease and critical ill fit, uh, failure. And where you are on this continuum changes every single day. Today I'm feeling really good. I'm over here, okay? Some days I don't feel so good. I might be over here. Hopefully I'm never over here, all the way over here, okay? Because that's really sick. But most of us kind of spend our time. And where you are in that continuum is a function of your intrinsic genetic makeup, your epigenetics, your physiology, your cell biology, and all the things you become exposed to on the outside. Your society, your community, your family, your environment. The one thing I, I left out here that should be included also is your behavior. I, I put behavior as part of your environment. Uh, some people split out environment. Behavior is obviously a crucial determinant of health and disease also, okay? So where you are on any given day is a function of all these things that are external on the top and all these things that are internal that are part of your intrinsic makeup. And that's the way we need to educate doctors, that's the way we need to take care of patients, and that's the way of, as patients we need to be taken care of. Now it's not only genes, it's not just about genes, the environment is probably more important. Behavior is probably more important than any single genetic thing. And you know, we've wiped out many diseases in many parts of the world simply by changing the environment. We got rid of cholera, we eradicated smallpox, we're close to polio. That has nothing to do with genetics, that's just good public health, okay? That's changing the environment so that these things don't exist. In the United States, we're having a huge problem now is they reintroduced measles. And, you know, and, but that's, that's, you know, that's the environment. So this is our curriculum, I'm not gonna show you that. So when we did this, we, we, we kind of spent about five years thinking about this curriculum between about 2003 and 2008. We had a lot of skeptics. Um, people said, oh, we're not ready for this paradigm change. It's, it's, it's too nascent. It's not ready for prime time. And, and, uh, and there were some articles written about how this approach to individuality 
uh, this is uh, the Alex Internal Medicine 2009, saying that personalized genetic prediction, too limited, too expensive, too soon. Um, first of all, we're not advertising everything as genes, but I, we saw this coming, we knew this was coming. Technology always moves faster than you can account for. So the answer I gave back then, and I still do when people think that this paradigm is not coming, is what Robert Watson, the former president of IBM, said in 1943 when they discovered the computer. And he said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers for the whole world, okay? Most of you have five in your pocket right now, by the way, I'd like to point out, uh, between your iPads, your iPhones, your this and your that. Um, and it turns out that over the past couple of years, the individual paradigm, the individuality paradigm is entering all fields of medicine, all fields of, uh, of healthcare. So here's genes, environment, and individual differences in responding to treatment for depression. Here's asthma, and actually, we actually do a lot of individualized therapy for asthma now. I'm also a respiratory physician. In terms of managing the home and managing the medications we give people based on their allergic phenotype or their non-allergic phenotype. So we do this already. Uh, here's individualized osteoporosis. Remember I mentioned I used osteoporosis as the example. Um, the, the oncologists are way ahead of everybody in this. So if you unfortunately develop breast cancer right now, um, and remember, in, in the United States, one out of nine women will get breast cancer at some point in their life. All of the therapy now is individualized. They take your tumor and they genotype your tumor and they prescribe medications based on not overall gigantic trials, but what your tumor does, how your tumor behaves biologically. That's the way we do it. The oncologists are ahead of us. Um, the rest of us are all catching up. Here's an article recently, um, again, on individualized therapy, just came from the New England Journal not that long ago, uh, where they actually can diagnose disease in children in fetuses by taking blood from the mother and finding fetal DNA in the mother's blood and actually diagnosing so many genetic diseases from the, without even having to do an amniose, without even having to go into the fetus. That's astonishing to me. I and mean, it's just like, that's crazy. Uh, but that's where we're going. And we need to educate our doctors and our patients about this. And, but at the same time, here's an efficacy trial showing that a vaccine in China, where they gave it to 50,000 people, had efficacy in uh, eliminating uh, gastrointestinal illness. So both are important. Neither is one more important, and we have to be thinking about both. Um, here's a recent article that I was uh, interested in, personalized respiratory medicine. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. Actually, no, I won't talk about that. Um, and here's the way we're teaching our students to think about diseases. That they are, this is called disease networks. And what this does is it, it shows the relationship. Our, our understanding of diseases is changing based on biology. That diseases that we think, there are many diseases that manifest by patients distinctly in one organ system, but are very closely related to other organ systems, and we're, we're drawing these maps showing that biologically many diseases kind of exist in a in, in kind of a, a crux between two areas. And I'll say that the one that's kind of evolving the most and the fastest in that guy is autoimmune disease. That how our body responds to autoimmune diseases is our understanding is changing dramatically. And what I'm proposing is that we think about disease differently. We think about it from an individuality perspective, and we think of it from a biologic perspective, and we get out of the machine model and stop thinking about it as a machine. This is a very interesting study, and I think this is where we as patients are going to be going soon. So this is a study from 2011, or 2010, in The Lancet, where they took one person, okay? One person in 2008, and they did a really good history. They talked to him, they found out about all his exposures, they talked about his family history and stuff like that, and then at the same time they did a genetic, what's called single nuclear polymorphism screen at the same time, of whatever they knew were the genetic risks of disease. And they came up with this figure. And this figure on the outside has all of this person's environmental exposures. And you can see this guy was a smoker, he didn't get a lot, he got some exercise, not a lot, he didn't have a terribly good diet, et cetera, et cetera. And on the inside is the genetic factors that they knew back then influenced disease. And the largeness of the type tells you that person's risk, of relative risk of disease. Um, and this person, as an individual, is based on all his risk, has a pretty high risk of osteoarthritis, cardiac disease, diabetes, more so than depression, hypertension, or other things. 
And I think this is the way we need to start educating physicians, and we even as patients need to think about our own health and disease, that we're all at risk for some things, and we try to modify as best we can the risk that we can control, and, and focus our energies on some of the ones that we, we might be at higher risk of. Now this was old knowledge, this was 2005 information. Um, but, um, but here, does anybody know who that person is? Anybody know who that is? Pardon? James Watson. Yeah. So that's James Watson. Do you know what he's holding? Okay, so he is holding, in 2007, he was the first person to have a whole exome sequence completely. And it's on a big disk drop up there. So he was the first person to be given his entire genetic sequence. Okay, they presented to him at a big party. Why? Because he kind of discovered DNA. But now it turns out that you can whole sequence people now for less than about $1,000. It's about, three, in the United States, it's about 3,000, but it's dropping fast, okay? So that soon, we're gonna be able to give patients on thumb drives their entire genetic sequence. Now, what does that mean? I don't know yet. For some things I do know, but for other things I don't know. But I promise you, in 10 years, we're gonna know a lot more than we are now, and we better be educating medical students and doctors for how to deal with this information. Because the moment it's, you know, on the equivalent of $500, people are going to start buying it because they're curious. And they're going to say, well, what the heck does this mean? You know, we've got to be ready to tell them about that. It's coming. So what are the implications of the individuality paradigm for physicians and students? Um, they make you appreciate mechanisms of disease from a totally different um, context, much more complex, much more interrelated. There's very few linear systems in medicine any longer. It's all systems biology now. We have to be teaching systems biology to medical students. We should think about risk and prevention in different ways. We should think about individual risk and also public health risk. Because they're very different, they're both very important, okay? Turns out my risk of disease, certain diseases, is purely very much predicated on what I imbibe, how I behave, and my intrinsic genetic risk. But my risk of things like cholera has to do with whether I drink clean water or not, okay? So I think we need to think about that in terms of risk. I think we need to rethink the whole notion of evidence-based medicine. Most evidence-based medicine we practice now is based on gigantic trials of thousands of people, and the signal to noise ratio is often very much distorted. I think as we get better at doing research, this is where the researchers need to really weigh in. We've got to understand what we're studying and in whom we're studying it, because there may be signals that we miss or signals that we overemphasize, such, for example, the osteoporosis example. All women do not get osteoporosis. I think that we, it, it requires a resurgence of the history and patient contact. If, you're gonna, if, I'm, if I'm gonna be treated as an individual, my doctor has to know who I am. They have to know where I live, they have to know who my parents were, my grandparents, what my exposures are, what my behaviors are. You have to spend time with your patient. Pharma industry has mixed use of this, turns out. So pharma, classic pharmaceuticals and industries, they want a drug that everybody has to take. The whole world should be taking blank, because that's how they sell the drug. On the other hand, it turns out that a lot of us don't need to be taking a lot of these drugs. Not everybody with a high cholesterol needs to be taking a statin, probably. On the other hand, there's a lot more, the, the whole growth of targeted personalized drugs has exploded, and again, I use oncology as the example. So, Pharma has mixed opinions about this. Um, we do need individualized therapies. They're probably already expensive to produce, and right now all the individualized therapies are extremely expensive. Um, but they will get cheaper with time, hopefully. And pharma needs to get away from trying to sell drugs to everybody. So um, there's a lot more coming. What's next? Well, it turns out that uh, the term metagenome is the name. So it turns out that we have a huge genome living in our body that is not our own genome. It turns out it's all the bacteria living in our colon. We have, because there's many, there's on the order of 10 or 100 times more genes living in our colons than we have in our bodies. And it turns out that those bacteria are important determinants of health. How you manage your, your, your diet and the bacteria that live in your colon have already been shown to be important determinants of many bowel disease and autoimmune diseases. And I think the understanding between not only our environment, but our, that environment is going to be very, very important. That, to me, that's the, one of the next waves of, of where medical research needs to go. And for those of you here, I promise you that the metagenome of someone who lives in this part of the world 
and therefore it, it, its determinants on health are very different than what's going on in Europe, North America, or Asia. And these are ways, these are things that have to be studied individually in the context that's locally relevant, okay? Uh, because you cannot extrapolate studies that take place in Europe and North America to this part of the world because they're different, okay? I promise you. And it's not just the genetics. It's the fact that the diet here is different and that there's some things that we don't understand about the diet. I know that when I moved to Asia, um, my, I'm sure my metagenome uh, changed dramatically. I actually lost a lot of weight when I lived in Asia, even though I, I ate everything in sight, and I didn't exercise anymore. And I, I, I personally believe, I don't have proof, I personally believe that it was because I changed my metagenome because I was eating more indigenous food there um, that had different characteristics. And there's some data to support that, by the way. And then it gets even more complicated because it turns out that even within tumors, tumors are not one uh, cell type, even within tumors, there's all kinds of heterogeneity in terms of tumors and stuff like that. That's coming out. The cancer people are figuring that out pretty fast. So I'm going to close by saying that we are in the early phases of a paradigm shift in medicine, and it relates to ver human variability and human individuality. I believe that physicians and scientists need to be educated in the context of this paradigm in order to advance research and clinical care. I think we need improved phenotyping. We need to understand who patients are better. We need to appreciate complexity, systems biology, network theory. And physicians need to know their individual patients. Medical curricula should incorporate this conceptual framework as the starting point, as far as I'm concerned. And also remember that truth is dynamic. Um, truth is not a fixed truth. There are very few fixed truths. We can argue about that. Um, but in medicine, I promise you, there's very few or hardly any fixed truths. And they must be advanced and modified through research, and this is where we have to keep advancing ourselves. So I'll go back and I'll close with William Oser. This is William Oser um, again. And look about, he, he said this in 1903. He knew this 120 something years, 115 years ago. He said, variability is the law of life. As no two faces are the same, no two bodies are alike, no two individuals react alike and behave alike under the abnormal conditions which we know as disease. He was confined to an old paradigm because he did not have the tools to escape it. He knew that there was a better answer there somewhere, and it took us you know, about 100 years to get to it. Um, and, and I think we're there, and we should just keep working on that. So with that, I would say thank you.